transmissibility at the population level um, as well. There we go. Okay, that works. Should be working over there. Sorry, this one's not displaying it. Okay, no worries. Okay, and so we model the interactions between the pathogen and the immune system in the body. Um, we then look at so if an individual has a certain level of immunity, how protective, uh, how protected are they against infection? Um, a few weeks later, or many uh, a long time later, or how severe their symptoms will be. So we look at area underneath these curves to look at symptoms. Um, we do the same thing for vaccination. We look at uh, how uh, their immune system develops memory and antibodies from vaccination. We look at how protected uh, uh, they are over time because their immunity can decay. Um, so using area under different curves, we can look at how sick someone will be. Um, we do the same thing for vaccination, and then when we're looking at how sick someone will be um, and maybe whether they have a mild infection or asymptomatic, we have to consider when we're looking at their, these individuals in the population what their behavior will be. Um, and essentially wearing, like do, practicing social or physical distancing, wearing masks, also is going to affect your effective susceptibility and your effective transmissibility. So we have to incorporate those things too. Um, so at the population level, of course, we're also interested in looking at how diseases are spreading around the world, but we mainly focus on how immune systems are moving around the world. And so when we look at different, say, immigration patterns to different cities in Canada, we take into consideration vaccination programs and diseases that are uh, prevalent in an individual's country that they have come from to immigrate to Canada, and we have to incorporate that into the, our calculations of distributions of immunity at the population. And so, for example, if we're looking at measles, um, the distribution of measles immunity in the Toronto population would be quite different to, say, Regina, given that our uh, immigrant population varies in size and in um, country of origin. Okay, so on the left hand side, just this is a blow up of a figure that I've already shown. Um, so what we're really interested in for vaccination and infection is what that initial response is going to look like. So you get some antibody and some effector T cells. Some of the cells that um, are generated by the vaccine or from the infection will then become memory cells uh, and we have antibodies too. And then you can see that if you're exposed in a, sh a short period later, a short time frame later, you may have an inapparent reinfection or you could be totally protected against infection. Um, and then if you look at um, maybe years later, this is especially true for measles um, or say pertussis, uh, you could have a mild or inapparent reinfection if you're exposed years later, or you could also have an asymptomatic infection or just a boost in your immunity. And so on the right hand side, what we're really interested in is looking at how these, um, uh, how your immunity is boosted and then might wane over time and then is boosted again by vaccination or infection and so on. So we're looking at this conveyor belt and I'll attribute this conveyor belt analogy to Gurgley and to Lindy Wall. Um, and so you can also think though that it's not necessarily your immunity that is decaying. It could be your effective immunity that is decaying over time. And so if we think about this for influenza uh, and some other pathogens like COVID that um, evolve quite quickly over time, um, then the immunity that you gained, say, from your influenza infection a couple years ago, um, while you still might have a lot of antibodies against that strain this year, the new strain, that the, the more dominant strain that's circulating right now has evolved probably away from that strain. And so your effective immunity, your protection against getting infected uh, by the new strain has, has uh, decayed. Okay, so we have to think about waning immunity and uh, uh, the evolution of the pathogen over time too. 
So one thing that we've been interested in uh, over COVID, I have been working uh, for the COVID Immunity Task Force, is in trying to determine what the seroprevalence is uh, for COVID in specific populations. And so uh, here is a study that is led by the COVID Immunity Task Force. Um, and the dots here are data from different seroprevalence studies uh, in the population. Uh, a big one coming from the Canada, Canada Blood Services and in Quebec from Hema Quebec, where they measure the antibodies against spike and against N, the nucleocapsid, uh, for all the blood donors uh, in, in the population. I wouldn't say all, some select group uh, of, from, from these uh, populations. And so the COVID Immunity Task Force gets this data from Canada Blood Services and from Hema Quebec. And uh, uh, that's what the dots are, these different studies. And then um, they've developed a statistical model to determine or to estimate what the seroprevalence is against COVID S or N over time. And so we look at S specifically for the spike protein prior to vaccination, that would give us some seroprevalence uh, from infection, gained from infection. Uh, post vaccination program coming in, of course, we're going to then start um, counting uh, antibodies in people generated by the vaccines. And then for it, that's why uh, they start looking at N over time because N is generated from infection and not from vaccination. And so they look at this and try to estimate what the distribution or what the seroprevalence is in Ontario, Quebec, all the different provinces uh, over time. And so this is from a, a previous modeling report that goes to like November, 2021. Okay, so in other, other than using a statistical model, we can use a dynamical model to generate the immunity distributions in the population. And so we're interested in quantifying the level of immunity against SARS-CoV-2 over time from vaccination and infection by age and considering different variants of concern. And so in order to do this, we need to understand immunity generation from vaccination understand immunity generation from infection, and understand immunity protection by age and variant of concern over time. So what we want to do uh, or to incorporate into our models is, uh, and, and to look at specific components for data, is we want to track infections and vaccination by age, and we can align some, some uh, components of those to actual data sources. Um, in Canada, we have mostly in the in the beginning had mRNA vaccines and adenovirus, so we incorporate those coverages uh, from the data into our mathematical models, and we look at the in-host modeling uh, or the in-host studies of how immunity is generated from these vaccines. Uh, and we also have to track public health interventions, so which affect contact structure in the population, because we want to incorporate age in this, um, and they also affect your effective suscept susceptibility and transmissibility of the virus. Okay, so the first thing uh, to consider is what is immunity? Well, I'm going to talk about antibodies and B cell memory, and as well as T cell memory from CD4 and CD8 T cells, there's lots of other components. And generally, um, or simplistically, we can think about immunity this way, where antibodies can protect you from being infected. and T cells, memory T cells, if you become infected, can really protect you from having severe um, uh, symptoms. And so you may even have an asymptomatic infection because your T cell memory is, is, is quite high. Okay, so these things protect you against infection, protect against severe disease, but uh, your immunity can wane. We do know for antibodies induced from infection and from vaccination, the antibody levels can decay over time um, and they can vary by variant of concern. So we need to also look at immune escape mechanisms. We certainly have experienced that with Omicron and how it's been able to escape the, uh, the immunity that you have um, and, and you can become infected. Okay, so here is a mathematical model that we developed 
uh, for a vaccination for an adenovirus vaccine. Um, of course, there are many different components of the immune system that we can incorporate into a mathematical model, but we also need to simplify the dimensions of the model so that we can um, predict, project or predict what parameters our mathematical model should have dependent on the data that we get. And so here we have data um, for um, specific antibodies, uh, interferon gamma and interleukin-6. And so this is a paper led by past postdoc Suzanne Farhang Sardrudi, where we looked at this mathematical model in bold. So what we have is we have our vaccine coming in at the top. Um, it activates our T helper cells, our TH0. Um, the T helper cells then can uh, induce interferon gamma in the body to the left, and interfer interferon gamma can induce an effector cell response um, uh, to make effector memory cells. And our TH on the right arm from the TH0 will say that they um, help induce interleukin-6 secretion, and interleukin-6 then helps induce the B cell response of your immune system, which makes plasma cells and uh, generates antibodies. So we fit this mathematical model to data, um, and you can see what that looks like here. So here, the dots and the dashed lines are data from a clinical trial of uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine, where they looked at one dose or two doses in different age groups. And so we fit the mathematical model to one dose, and that's the blue, the blue curves. And so that's the blue curves here. And then we fit the mathematical model also to two doses, and you can see the red is the second dose. And we look at what our parameter values are and how uh, they um, uh, may be different for different age groups. Okay, but I'm just showing one fit here. We've also used a very similar model for uh, Pfizer and Moderna study. Uh, on the right hand side here, I'm showing a fit that we have for to clinical trials for both Pfizer and Moderna, where green is mRNA1273, so that's Moderna clinical trial data. Um, red is BN2, BNT162B2, which is Pfizer. Um, and we fit a very similar mathematical model to the data for that. Uh, what's important to understand or to see on the y-axis for many of these figures is AU, which stands for arbitrary units. And so when we're looking at the data that um, is published or presented in um, immunology papers, the, they're often presented in arbitrary units. And so even though you see on the right-hand side, the green dots are higher than the red, that doesn't mean that Moderna clinical trials showed better IgG response or IgG is an antibody to Pfizer, except uh, we, we, have, we do have one study incorporated in this data where the same hands and the same lab looked at Moderna and Pfizer, um, and you can see where the green and the red overlap, that is the data from that study, and so um, we'll, we'll say that you can't draw a conclusion that Moderna is better than Pfizer from this figure. Pardon? What do you mean by arbitrary unit? Arbitrary unit, so it's, just, it's unitless. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here we fit mathematical models to vaccination data. We quantify the antibody output. So here we have our IgG response in the top left and in the top right. Uh, we also have an interferon gamma response down here. Uh, we use these because we know that they're related to different types of memory cells, interferon gamma and interleukin-6 and different antibodies. So we can infer uh, what our populations of memory cells are looking like in our in-host model. And so we can then determine estimates for decay rates of antibodies and memory cells using these mathematical models and these data sets. And so one thing when we look at this, the top left is the AstraZeneca, those two figures, uh, is the AstraZeneca study. And what we did here is we looked at, well, what happens if we spread our two doses further apart? 
um, so that we're not following what the two doses are separated by 28 days in the clinical trial. So we looked at what happens if our two doses are spread further apart, which is what we did do here in Canada. And we also looked at, um, and I'm not showing the results, what happens when your second dose is, say, a fraction of a full dose, so a half dose or a quarter dose, and so on, um, to see what your uh, antibody and T cell um, uh, levels would look like. But on, on the right, on the top, the two top graphs here, we're just showing what our outcomes look like if we have two full doses. And so you can see here that our mathematical model has a similar decay rate, um, no matter what the two, how far the two doses are spread apart. But you can see that there's a difference in the magnitude of the antibodies over time, as well as the T cells. Uh, and that's just, that's quite intuitive, but we're able to quantify what that might look like. On, in the other three figures, what we did is we looked at what our decay rate of our antibodies are for Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. And um, this, we were doing this research around the time when the CDC was recommending, I think it was eight months between dose two and the booster dose. Um, and what we found is that um, by fitting these, this mathematical model to the data, that by day 190, you have 99% loss of your antibodies from the Pfizer vaccine. And for Moderna, we have that 99% loss by day 238. And so what we suggested with our work is that your, the vaccines should be separated by no more than six months. And it was a, when we were doing this study that the CDC also changed what their recommendation was. Um, so that was interesting. What I haven't shown you here is the output that we get from the memory for the memory cell populations. Um, but we do incorporate uh, the knowledge that we get from the memory cell populations and the antibodies into all of our knowledge for what's happening with in-host vaccination so that we can help figure out uh, or help uh, parameterize population level models of immunity. Uh, we also look at in-host models of infection. So here's a mathematical model that we use to fit to infection data uh, by, uh, from a collaborator here at the University of Toronto. Um, but what they do is they measure interleukin-2, interferon gamma, and granzyme B in patients that have mild, moderate, and severe infection. We fit the same mathematical model to each patient, and we try to see what the differences are in the parameter values for these different types of infections. Okay, and so here on the left-hand side, we're showing what the fit looks like to different patients. And we have our population fits at the top where we fit the model to all patients at the same time. Um, what you can see here, so if you look at the green, red, and black lines, the black is severe, uh, red is moderate, and green is mild. And so you can see that when you're looking at interferon gamma, your interferon gamma levels are lower on average in in infected patients that have mild infections versus moderate versus severe. And you can see that the decay rates are slightly different versus severe and the other two types. Um, with interleukin-2, you can see a similar, a similar thing where your peaks are different. Yeah, the time of your peak is a little bit different too and the decay is different. But for granzyme B, we don't see uh, such a big difference in peak, but we do see a difference in the decay. So what you can also see here, um, and in another study that we did where we fit a lot of uh, the same mathematical model to infection data, uh, big cohort studies, what we've been able to find is that for a mild infection, your viral load is lower and your, your infection is shorter. Um, and that's something that uh, we incorporate into our mathematical model at the population level too. So 
we're looking at duration of immunity because that's going to affect the protective levels of people in the population. So apart from all these in-host studies that we've been looking at, and I haven't looked, talked about all of the in-host modeling that we've been doing, we incorporate all of the conclusions and, and results from our in-host studies, but we also look at the literature, we uh, do a sensitivity analysis to look at the different assumptions that we've incorporated into our models, um, and we really try to understand what your uh, immunity will look like after vaccination and infection and, and how this can change with age. I didn't say that we also looked at this, um, the, the vaccination output here for different age groups and different sexes to see what would happen. Okay. So um, this is a mathematical model now at the population level where we're looking at distributions of immunity in the population. And this project is in collaboration with Xilan Feng, who's here, as well as Gurgli Rost, who's here at the Fields Institute. Um, and so early on, before we even knew all of this information about in-host uh, vaccination and infection, we, I mean, we study mathematical, or we study immunity effects in the population. Um, and we were able to intuitively develop a mathematical model like this this mathematical model where we incorporated mild moderate and severe infections and this is uh, actually a model that is a, a building up of a model that we had previously used to study pertussis so we developed this mathematical modeling structure and it actually is very handy when we're looking at the in-host models and all of the different mild moderate and severe infections and the outcomes of vaccination uh, that we've been able to incorporate directly into this into this in our assumptions okay so what what we have here is we have everyone starts in the susceptible one class so everybody is is naive and when you're exposed to infection you can become mildly infected which is asymptomatic moderate where you have some symptoms or severe where you definitely have symptoms and you'll go see a doctor and some subset of the severe infections will go to hospital. And we assume that the immunity that you get after a mild infection bumps you up to this S2 class after moderate S3 and after severe you get S4 immunity. And we assume that the immunity can wane over time. And as the immunity wanes, the probability that you have a mild, moderate or severe infection can change. The probabilities that you have mild, moderate, or severe infection will change with respect to age. So this is a model that we also have for different age groups. And we have five-year age groups that we're looking at. When we're looking at vaccination, we have to incorporate the fact that there will be two doses. And so we have individuals move to the first row of the purple vaccine row here. Um, so we move from S1 to B11, S2 to B21, and so on. And then when they obtain the second dose, they move down to the immune classes at the very bottom row. And the shading of purple uh, means that we're assuming that the characteristics of their immunity is similar to the same shade of purple in the susceptible classes. And so B11 has similar immunity characteristics to S2, B21 to S3, and all the other classes to S4, which means that they'll be resistant to infection. But we allow their immunity to wane over time as well, and you can see where they, uh, they will wane to using the black lines. Now, if there are any questions about the model? Do you specify them? Yeah, so the waning rate is closely related. Well, it's what we assumed, but uh, we, we've done a lot of a sensitivity analysis on the waning rate. Um, but you could probably, and Gurgly, you can pipe in or Gilan, uh, you can probably think that the waning rate can be uh, some average of your antibody and memory T cell waning. Uh, but then the, the probabilities of mild, moderate, and severe infection will change too. And so if you're infected, then the probability uh, of, of flipping you more down to the mild end is a reflection of, 
of your T cells. Yeah, because I'm I'm running into my neighbor and and I talked to him and how are you doing? He said, "Oh, I got infected again." I, what do you mean? I said, "What do you mean again?" He said, "Well, I was he was infected in September and then again." So it looks at, I said, "Did you have immunization?" He said, "It was three times." That means the the antibodies were not you know uh, activated. Maybe the T cells. Uh, actually, as you mentioned, because you, you reinfection occurs, yeah. but the uh, serenity is, you know, it's reduced. There. Yeah, so I mean, the suboptimal level of antibodies. So I, I mean, I'm just curious, you know, what the model would be able to to distinguish the differences between us. Uh, well, we try to to tease that apart in in analyzing the results in the discussion. Yeah, but okay. Ho hopefully, we'll be able to see some of that. Yeah, thank you. And so uh, when we're, we're choosing what these probabilities are of going to mild, moderate, or severe infection, that is um, uh, provided to us by data, uh, by a paper by, uh, where, over there it's, it's the Clark paper, where what they've done is they've looked at comorbidities in all populations of the world, and they've looked at which comorbidities increase your probability of a severe infection um, by age. And so we use that data to, gen to tell us what our P's will look like, and then we modify the P's given some of the observations that people have, have had uh, from the effects of vaccination and previous infection. Uh, we also fit the model so that we have a reproduction, a basic reproduction number uh, in the middle of this range here by this paper by uh, Mishra, uh, which is a, a paper specific to Canada, and we fit it to about 2.6. Um, and then there are a lot of assumptions in here too about the waning rate, um, uh, how, what your susceptibility really is in, in these different susceptible classes and vaccinated classes and so on, but we do a lot of sensitivity analysis on that, uh, which I'm not going to talk about today. Uh, when we're looking, because this model is age structured, so we also have to incorporate um, all the age groups, so we have to incorporate our contact mixing matrix, and so we use the synthetic contact mi mixing matrices from uh, Prem, Cook, and JIT. And then we also modify these matrices to, um, to reflect the public health mitigation strategies that are being used over specific time periods. And so here uh, on the bottom right, we have no mitigation. And then on the top left, we have when there was the full lockdown and in between with phase one and phase, uh, oh, there's no phase two here anyway. <laughs> Uh, we have different matrices that reflect school closure, work from home, some work from home, um, uh, P, uh, looking at workers that have to go to work, um, and so on. Um, and we, we change the, which matrices we're using for different time periods over the year, depending on what the provinces are, are uh, implementing in their strategies. A really important thing on the right-hand side is to see that uh, the age group, the 15 to 19 year olds in all of these mixing matrices have the higher uh, contact rate, the highest uh, contact rate. And when we were doing our first study on vaccination, we found that um, the indirect effect of any vaccination of the 15 to 19 year olds has a positive effect on all of the other age groups. And so when a vaccine would be available to the 15 to 19 year olds, we recommended that they be vaccinated as soon as possible because that had a really good indirect effect for all the other populations as well. I told you that we have to incorporate all the public health mitigation strategies. Uh, we have a GitHub where we have uh, collected all of the different public health mitigation uh, stages and steps and, ch and changes for each province and territory in Canada. Uh, and we have developed these timelines, as well as um, looked at how severe the public health mitigation has been over time and looking at different averages. And Ontario has had the, the strictest lockdowns uh, um, and, and more mitigation strategies on average over time, which is probably a reflection of the fact that the public 
our, our healthcare system doesn't have uh, a good number of beds for our population. Okay, and this, if anybody's interested in this data, just uh, contact me and we can give you access to the GitHub. Okay, so I said before that our mild infections, we're going to assume that these infections are reported only through contact tracing, or say if they're going to go visit grandma. Uh, the, the moderate infections, some of these infections are reported since they have some mild symptoms, but they'll also be contact traced. And then the severe infections, we assume that they will all go to doctor and some fraction of them will go to hospital. Um, and we can fit this mathematical model to case report data where we assume that maybe all, so all of I-4s will be in the case report data and some fraction of I-3 and some smaller fraction of I-2. And we do a sensitivity analysis on that to look at what the fits look like to the population uh, case report data over time. We also, um, because of Omicron, have shifted the model to be fitting to hospitalization data instead, which is some subset of the I-4s. Okay, but that has a complication where we then have to start calculating what the length of stay is uh, over time too and how that changes. We also incorporate different effects of the vaccines, how protective the vaccines are against infection, how protective they are from moving people from like down, down the pathway down to more mild infections and so on. And we do a sensitivity analysis on that. Okay. So we actually only fit two parameters in this model. One is the initial infection rate and the other is this kappa, which is a multiplic multiplicative factor um, of, uh, of the infection rate, which incorporates all these different effects, PPE compliance and relaxation, just uh, compliance and relaxation of your social distancing behaviors, how testing rates change over time and contact tracing rates. Uh, looking at how the virus transmissibility changes over time too with alpha, beta, omicron, and the effect of weather on transmissibility. And we're trying to, uh, in new studies, try to tease these different effects apart. But we do fit the mathematical model to data. We determine what beta is from that basic reproduction number. We determine what kappa is and how it changes over time. We do lots of sensitivity analysis. This is what a fit looks like to Ontario data up just before the Omicron era. Um, so you can see where we're looking are, we're fitting in between incidents of severe infections and incidents of moderate and severe. So you can see what the output look, looks like. Um, we then tease that apart. We then, I think I'm muted on the, am I muted on the computer? It says unmute myself. Anyway. Um, uh, we then tease that apart to look at what the infections are going to look like for the different age groups. And you can see that we do, we do get a lot of infections. We capture them, the moderate infections in the zero to nine year olds. But as individuals get older, um, we see that they don't necessarily go, go to the doctors and we get just the severe infections. Okay, uh, here is what the output of our vaccination looks like for first dose and second dose, and we compare that to data, the data that we've used to inform our vaccination uptake, and so on. And then what we can do is we can look, we can project then, we can plot out our, all of our individuals in the S classes and in the V classes, and we can look at what the distribution of immunity will be and how it's changing over time. And so, here is what our distribution of immunity looks like for Ontario in the, in the left. And when we look at this, we can say, okay, so green is immunity where you're totally resistant to infection. Yellow is where you have some protection against, you have a lot of protection against infection and a lot of protection against severe infection if you do get infected. Blue is a little bit less than that. And red is you have total susceptibility. And so we can see here, if you look at the blue and the, and the yellow, you can see they're going up. So that lets us see that most infections in the resurgence uh, in, the, in the fall of 2021 would be mild and moderate. Um, we can also see in the red that there's a 
lot of low level of immunity in age groups 12 to 29. And so we suggested that there be a campaign to get individuals that are 12 to 29 to go out and get vaccinated. When we do look at the severe infections on the far right, we're able to see what the age distribution is in all of the severe infections in the fall wave. And we could see this is, and this is fit only to September, so we project forward, and we can see in the fall wave, we project that 50% of severe infections will be in individuals who are 50 plus. And so we recommended that the booster dose, the third dose of the vaccine, be provided to everyone 50 plus as soon as possible. Okay. When we look at the severe infections, and so this is Ontario and I-4, so severe infections only, we're also able to see what immune classes they're coming from. And so most of them, of course, are in red. So those are individuals that have no immunity um, or, or have had previous infection or vaccination and have had their immunity wane uh, right back to susceptibility. But you can also see that some of those infections are coming from low levels of immunity in that I2 or the S2 class. And then there's a little bit of yellow down in the older age groups um, as well. And so really what we're seeing is that uh, most infections were coming from for the fall wave uh, would be coming from individuals that had not been vaccinated and had not been infected or have been vaccinated or infected and have had their immunity wane over time. Okay, um, when we're using this model two, because we fit the model to like a fraction of I4, I3, I2, we can look at how ascertainment rate changes over time too, when we're, we're looking at the, um, uh, the case report data versus the true number of infections that our model projects. And so you can see that prior to vaccination, the ascertainment rate is about 2.5 to one. So for every one reported infection, there are two and a half not reported. Um, but vaccination, remember, moves people down to the more mild infections, which we assume in the model, in our model fits, that you don't capture very well. And so after vaccination, the ascertainment rate is about five. And so for every one reported infection, there are five infections that aren't reported. Okay, so finally, we have modified the model to incorporate the third booster dose, the fourth booster dose, and so on, and the Omicron era. And so this is a preliminary fit that we did for Ontario um, a couple months ago, but we have be much better fits now. And we're using these pr to project or to look back on the Omicron era to see what, how the distributions of immunity have evolved over the different age groups and how they're going to move forward uh, into the fall and the spring uh, for this year and next. And what I'd just like to say is that this work has been a huge collaboration. And I thank uh, Gurgli, who's here, and Jilan, who's uh, on Zoom, uh, and all the different funding bodies. And if you're interested in any of the data or any of the results that I presented today, we have lots of other studies too that I haven't presented, uh, let us know. Uh, or let me know, and I'll be happy to share. Thank you. Okay, we got lots of time for questions. Hey, Jim. <laughs> I'm pretending to be you. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, on the on the data of pre previous ones. Oh, this, yeah, this one, sorry. Um, yes. So do you, can you kind of, um, do you know why the, at the beginning, at the beginning, the, the, the curve for the blue and then the, I think it's the brown curve, they, they have been closed and then they kind of uh, separated. It's kind of the explanations or mechanism behind this to explain. Yeah, sure. So the blue curve is first dose coverage and the brown curve is second dose. And early on in the vaccination program in Canada, they were providing the two doses um, uh, to the people who were getting the vaccine, who are the older age groups and the healthcare workers early on, uh, with the recommended 21 or 28 days between doses. 
but then there was a limitation in the number of doses available. And so Canada decided to spread the doses apart. And so you'll see then that the blue and the brown curves do get further apart. So people couldn't go get that second dose as early as the people could get it earlier on in the vaccination program. Oh, so you model, you, you did an including this. That's why it is not, not so um, the fit. But when we compare this one to the layer one, is it because of you in your model, do you consider this or no? Yeah, we incorporate the change and all policies get incorporated into the model. And you'll see, um, you can kind of see it, but not very well in this data as well, that these curves are actually closer to this curve uh, in the actual coverage. But we, we use the actual coverage data to, to fit to, and those are the results that we get considering that not all people who are vaccinated will get immunity. Great, thank you. Thank you, Prime. Yeah, I just um, wondering do you have any data uh, for uh, for Canada about the repeat infections? Yeah. Uh, so one thing that the COVID immunity task force is doing now, so they have funded a lot of immunology studies, um, and these studies have kept track of as well as they can. Uh, repeat infections and infections in people who've been vaccinated and between what doses and so on. And so there's um, a, a lot of work right now in the CITF to um, couple the, the, the Zero survey data from Canada Blood Services to um, data databases in each province. Um, but we're looking at two provinces to start to look at how to couple that with infection data um to see how if we can get some conclusions as to how effective the vaccines are by age in preventing infection but we do have that data while we're trying to get that data the provinces have it thank you uh, like to have some questions from uh, our participants online can we see who's asking questions I don't think anybody in the chats. If you have questions, you can just unmute and uh, speak, or you can type them in the chats. So that way, I can read it. So, in the meantime, any more questions? In the, I I kind of have a question about uh, this uh, zero serology data uh, from blood services because. How do they extrapolate that to the population, the entire population? That statistical model they do, yeah. because blood donors are usually adults. Sort of, how do you? Uh, so yeah, do so know, blood or? donors are age sixteen plus, yeah, yeah. and there's it's also known that people who tend to go give blood are from a different, um, are not representative of the average population. Right. Um, and so they have a statistical model that they use, also given the fact that the assays that they use to, to um, measure the anti-S and the anti-N also have some error. Uh, so they have a statistical model that they right. use to take in all that data right. and then provide with the, those dots that we have. So especially for the very old people. I mean, that's very, I, mean, I, I don't think these people would go to donate blood. And they, these are, a lot of them are getting infected. It's like, I don't know how, how they, they actually get a hand on that based on, say, yeah, they 20, do have, 30 year old. Yeah, their statistical model is yeah. it has age as a variable. I'm sure. I'm sure but sure, I don't sure. know exactly what their model is. Yeah, and also, the true. model that the CITF has right. um, is also age, incorporating. Right? Yeah. 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 So that must be a really skillful <laughs> stats work there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Online? No? Oh, okay. So, okay, so let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Yeah, we have a 30 minute coffee break. And uh, yes, so, yeah. So, we'll be back in half an hour.
Mamba. <laughs> <laughs>